All right, everybody, welcome to Bear TV. Today, we are here to have a discussion about climate change, why it's bad, and what we can do to stop it or slow it down. And um, I would like to thank you guys all for participating, for your research, and for your questions. And I'm going to ask our distinguished panel of experts to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves before we begin our questions. We'll start with you, Elaine. Hi. I'm Elaine Hampton. I live in Las Cruces, and I was a science teacher there for many years. And then I came to UTEP, and I was a professor in the College of Education. And I worked on uh, some projects for curriculum for schools, and that's where your, your teacher, Ms. Gray, and I started working together on the air quality project. And uh, now I, um, I'm mostly retired, but I do some research in border issues and sometimes publish some information. My latest book is about Asarco. It's called Copper Stain, Asarco's Legacy in El Paso, and it deals with some of the air quality issues, too. Oh, hello, everybody. My name is Juan Aguilera. I'm a physician from Ciudad Juarez. Came to UTEP to study a degree in public health, and now I'm doing a PhD in interdisciplinary health sciences. So my usual way to tackling climate change effects had to be related to air quality, in which we have done studies to assess the effects of air pollution in children and adults that have asthma and also the effects it might have in chronic conditions such as uh, hypertension or diabetes. So very happy to be here and listen to your questions. Oh, hi everybody, my name is Mayra Chavez. I'm a PhD candidate at UTEP in civil engineering with my main focus is air quality and transportation. Uh, I've worked in a lot of projects in El Paso near highways and schools monitoring air around them. So it's basically combining transportation and uh, air modeling process. My name is Amanda Monroe. I work with the Southwest Environmental Center and we are a wildlife conservation organization based in Las Cruces, New Mexico, but our mission is to protect and preserve wildlife and their habitats throughout the Southwest, including here. Uh, one of the main issues that we work on is the border wall and how that affects wildlife. And we also work on just changing the way wildlife is managed. So I'll probably be talking a little bit more about how climate change affects animals. So now we know kind of how to direct our questions. Um, what got us started on this project was some teachers from the North Midwest who asked me to collaborate on a project about climate change and to talk about how climate change affects us differently depending on where we live in the country or around the world. So that's what got us started and we're kind of doing this in a timely way to celebrate Earth Day coming up. So that's our rationale. Um, we definitely want to understand the world around us a little bit better and what's going on. So we talked about what climate change is, um, where it comes from, and what are the greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. So I know we have some student questions about that topic. So um, if I can call on my group one, if you had a question about what processes cause climate change or what are the gases involved, now would be a great time for you guys to ask a question. say the energy industry, oil. Um, one thing, sometime you can get on your phone and go to Google Maps and look up Odessa and look at the satellite view and you'll see like a little network, a, a, a net, a red, um, all over that area. And every little dot in every little tiny square is an oil rig. And um, a colleague or a friend that I know worked in that area and he said if you go down one street in Odessa behind go heading toward the oil wells you'll get sick so sick that you could pass out just because of the gases that are emitted from all of that. Really? 
nitrous oxide? No. Uh, created by fertilizer. I'm um, assuming maybe it's a decomposition process. It right? has to so do with it, it exists in the fertilizer, and then as it degrades to nourish the plants, maybe the gas is released. It's like uh, nitrogen dioxide yeah. mixed with ammonia, uh -huh. and it's like nitrification, and that releases the nitrous oxide gas. So yeah, so it, um, it's a when you put that fertilizer on the ground, it decomposes into those mm -hmm. gases. So maybe we can talk about some of the greenhouse gases and which one we think is the worst because there are lots of different varying opinions and ideas about that. Anybody want to start? Let, let me do a little intro. I, I can't answer that directly, but um, your question I think is one of the most important things for the rest of the nation. <coughs> and world to understand what greenhouse gas is, you know, that it's like your car in the summertime or the wintertime when it's sunny and you roll the windows down, it's hot, 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 because the, the, the rays, the light that comes in just bounces around, it can't escape. And whatever gas gets up there at that ozone level and blocks um, any kind of the sun's rays coming in is going to just make it super hot in here. and that's. There is a study up um, on a mountain in Hawaii, uh, Mauna Loa, and a man for uh, almost 100 years has been, or the scientists have been charting the amount of carbon dioxide, which is the, um, which shows how much, that's one of the main gases, maybe the worst, I don't know, and showing that when he started about 80 years ago, and just a direct increase all the way up as we've been doing more and more industry, more and more oil, more and more energy resources. And so CO2 is the only one I know of. I think another one is methane, and I saw there's a couple other questions on here about methane. Um, one thing that is really contributing to climate change is industrial agriculture, so um, especially with cows. Um, Methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas uh, because it lasts in the atmosphere longer than CO2. Um, so that's I, maybe, I don't know if it's the worst, but it's definitely very powerful. It has a larger impact per molecule of methane. Um, and a lot of that is due to how we raise cows. So cows are meant to eat grass and we feed them a slurry of corn and antibiotics and whatever else is going into their food, uh, proteins from other animals, etc. And that does not sit well with their digestion and so they release a lot of methane. And so that is also a cause of greenhouse gases. And, and if you're not thinking that cows could produce that much greenhouse gas problem with methane, think about strong. How many McDonald's there are in the world, and how many cows it takes to produce all those hamburgers, and then you might have a better idea. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I guess I better hold this. I, I don't like microphones, but so my my point is, uh, methane is a problem if you think about McDonald's and cows, right? And how many cows it takes all over the world to grow that many hamburgers. Um, I didn't know that methane lasted longer in the environment than CO2, so that's interesting. I would have thought it might break down faster, but so yeah. So the gases are different based on their ability to absorb energy from the sun and how long they hold that energy before the gas itself breaks down and is not harmful anymore. Um, I think, Emma, was it your group maybe that had a question about... Um, so how the gases actually get trapped? I'm sorry, what was your question? So, so why can't some of these greenhouse gases escape into space, I guess, is the question? Or which gases is it that are creating that blockade in the first place? The ozone layer. That yeah, so we're mostly a life science. We haven't talked a lot about the ozone layer. But yeah, do you guys know about the ozone layer? A little bit. 
Okay, so I can take it. I can take it if you want. Is yeah. anybody else want to take it? Okay. So, okay, Diego, want to ask your question first? Okay, give it to us. Yes. Yes. So, so, um, what is ozone? Where does it come from? It is. What is it made out of? Oxygen specifically? Oxygen molecules in the air that are attracted to Earth by gravity, right? So we have gravity that keeps our gases surrounding our Earth, right? I'm right about that, right? <laughs> um, um, and then when sunlight hits the oxygen, O2, it radiates it and turns it into a radioactive gas, O3, which is ozone. And basically it's ozone that helps keep all the gases trapped in our atmosphere, which is good, right? It keeps our planet warm and livable. So that's important. But the problem is it's getting a little bit too hot in here, right? Did that answer the question? Okay. All right. So what are some other greenhouse gases we might want to talk about? So we talked about methane, carbon dioxide. Were there some others? So are there ways to decrease greenhouse gases? So we're going to, this is probably going to come up over and over again. So, well, it's very important, I think, to tackle the problem and understand that it has different solutions. Right now, I think the most important question was which one is the most important? But then again, if we just focus on one of them, then the other one's going to become the most important, then the other one. And it's not about just picking one, it's about knowing what is causing all this effect. As Dr. Hampton mentioned, uh, the energy industry. Uh, has a big part on the problem. So what things can we do? Well, we might need to select better choices on energy. Also, we were mentioning about the farming and how the animals are part of uh, all of these emissions. Mayra has been working in transportation as well, in which also the gases that are emitted through our vehicles, our cars, diesel fuels are contributing uh, nitric oxide was mentioned as well as one of the greenhouse gases. So the thing we need to be knowledgeable of is not in which area we need to focus, is what are the things that are causing it and how can we change that? Yeah, I think that's a good point because they all have different effects, right? And I know that you study the effects of some of these gases on our health. So as we segue into what climate change is and what causes it so energy production so we love our technology right but every time we use electricity we contribute to the greenhouse effect right we so could that be a solution right there maybe maybe we use a le less electricity somehow so i'm sure technology technology companies are working on more efficient devices that use electricity, stay charged longer. Do you think that would be a good solution to, or are you gonna quit using technology? No, probably not, right? So, so if we can create more efficient devices that use less electricity, that would be a good way to go as far as burning fossil fuels. Um, but let's go ahead and segue into why we need to be worried about it or maybe we don't need to be worried about it. So what are the effects of having these excessive gases in the atmosphere that stay in the atmosphere? So topic two, um, maybe uh, Dr. Aguilera, you could talk a little bit about um, air quality. And I know you all have a part to say in that and why we study this in the first place and how it relates to climate change. Well, the most important thing about air quality is to consider that a lot of the pollutants 
are gonna be reaching our bodies basically through our lungs if there is air pollution out there we're gonna be breathing if it's dust it's gonna go inside our upper respiratory tract if it's gases that are talking up we're talking about smaller particles they're gonna be going further down special populations are really more at risk when you consider if they have asthma people with asthma have a narrower respiratory tract so if more pollutants are getting stuck there what's going to happen to them they're going to have more trouble breathing if it's dusty out there if it, the environment is polluted they might have trouble doing physical activity doing exercise uh, we recently did a study at a school located near a freeway and we found that children with asthma over there engage in less physical activity just because they're actually going to their outdoor activities next to a freeway. So we're seeing that a polluted environment, in this case coming from the vehicles, is affecting our health. But not only for people with asthma. Also we know now that finer particles can go beyond our lungs because when we breathe air, what happens to that oxygen? It gets into our lungs, goes into our bloodstream, but also if those molecules, those pollutants are so fine and reach our bloodstream, it may cause inflammation and lead to other diseases. So these problems not only affect people that have trouble breathing, but also people with problems in their heart, uh, their circulation, if they have inflammation. And we're just talking about what enters in the air through our lungs. So we've studied a lot about the air quality in this particular area. So we've studied a lot about the air quality in this area because we sit in a valley, right? And we have a major freeway close by. We have a major border crossing close by, two of them. And so, Elaine, would you share a little bit about yeah, we'll that research? A, a question. Are, are we monitoring since the, the lines at the border are so horrible, four and five hours? Uh, are we monitoring the, uh, the quality of the air? Uh, right here, and there's a monitor pretty close by, mm -hmm. isn't there? Yeah. So the students are watching that? Yeah. No, so but yeah. <laughs> we should. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's you, you can actually go online and check the air quality from the monitor close to here and see what are the, um, what are the levels of pollution in the air at any given time. And then it's, it's your right to make a stink about it because, uh, like Dr. Aguilar said, you're, going, you're breathing that. You're breathing extra amounts, more than most anybody else, except the truck drivers probably sitting in the trucks. And it's right here in the school, and that's not fair at all, and not right. Yeah, that's interesting. And Ms. Chavez, um, this is something you study also? Oh, well, yeah, and I, I just want to, like, in all of El Paso, the area with the highest pollution is around here, around the border, and especially this school. Wow. <laughs> that's not good, right? <laughs> I went out and ran on the track a couple of weeks ago and I felt it in my lungs. I smelled it and I thought, wow, how many teams do we have practicing outside in the hot afternoon in this area, right? Yaritza, you want to comment? Have you ever noticed anything when you're outside practicing in the afternoon about the air? Is it hard to breathe? Do you smell the, you smell the pollution? Yes, Diego. Glass. It hurts. It can hurt sometimes. Yes. Yes. So can we stop them from building the bus barn so close to here? Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. Um, there definitely was a group of people that tried to protest that, but it didn't really get very far. Um, I don't know how many people it would have take, taken to protest that move to actually get them to change their minds about it, but um, economic policy drives a bunch of the decision making when it comes to that. And um, there are definitely some social justice issues involved in where more pollution happens and where less pollution happens. So does anybody want to comment on that? I can add to that. And I think for you, you 
as teenagers, young adults, starting to know the best ways to create change is really important. Because yes, right now there's a way to do it, which is you protest. But then again, how many people is that gonna take? If you want to create change in the school, for example, is it enough to just uh, protest in front of the principal's office? The most important thing is to be organized, to be together and know how the system works. I've been learning a lot when I started to study public health that it's not about just me reporting, okay, these are the health effects and they're bad. Well, we need to be able to translate this to the people that do the laws. We need to be engaged when it's time to vote so they know that the people that want to become mayors, representatives, need to attend the needs of the people from the region because if not, they're not gonna get votes. So being engaging in your civil rights to vote, it's really important because if they know that all the students in this school are gonna become voters in the next few years, then they need to attend to your needs. Also, talking to your parents because they might be able to talk to our representatives in the government. So if they get a lot of calls from parents and students from Bowie concerned about this topic, then they might say, wow, what is going on? I need to learn more about it. Maybe I need to go visit. Maybe I need to do exercise in the track and experience this glass inhaling feeling to see what is going on. So it's good to voice your concerns to use social media, to use uh, phone messaging, to use all means of communication. Because for us, this is an amazing way. It's the first time we've been hearing this coming directly from the students here at Bowie. And this is a great way for us to know that what we're doing matters for you guys as well. And to, to be informed, um, if you have your computer, you might look up Robert Bullard uh, he has written an awful lot about environmental racism and he has shown, he and several other researchers have found that the majority of high polluting industries in the United States and probably across the globe are located in communities where people of color live and or people who have low incomes. You don't see them located in the beautiful downtowns, the rich pe people's neighborhoods, they're located all along the south where people of color live and for some reason here in El Paso they've decided to put Bowie and the border right together. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair does it? No. That's why your voice is so important. I mean sometimes we don't think about how important our voice is but if we never stand up and speak then we get taken advantage of right so I like that you really talked about civic action and um, we don't think we don't relate always voting and knowing who the candidates are to these kind of issues, but there is a direct correlation because who passes the laws, right? That get things built where they're built, right? So important, really important. So um, pollution caused by greenhouse gases one effect that we need to be worried about. But my group two had some other questions about some of the other harmful side effects of climate change. Anybody from group two want to talk? Ask a question? Ian. So climate change effects on weather is the movie The Day After Tomorrow a possible reality for the future? It was a great movie. I'm surprised <laughs> they've seen it. <laughs> but so anybody want to handle extreme weather, like some extreme weather events and what we need to know about that? I haven't personally seen that movie, um, but I do think that we're already seeing the extreme weather events. For example, fires in California and in the Southwest are becoming more frequent. The season for fires is getting longer. We're seeing hotter fires, so the fires are burning so hot that they're 
burning the trees, which isn't usually what happens in a fire. In a normal fire, you would just burn the brush underneath the trees and the trees stay, stay standing. But these fires are burning so hot and so dry it, the trees are going up like matchsticks. And so that's one thing. And then we've also been seeing those extreme flooding events. I mean, Hurricane Sandy um, or Superstorm Sandy, I guess. Um, but yeah, we're, we're already seeing the effects, the extreme weather events and all over the globe. And that's having a huge impact. Uh, drought is another one. Uh, I think the droughts are getting worse and worse here in the Southwest and also south of here in Central America. And we think, I think it's been hypothesized that maybe some of the reason why a lot of small farmers are leaving Central America and coming north is because of climate change. They're climate refugees because they can no longer farm. The growing season is just not what it used to be. So all of that is happening as we speak. Literally right here to us in our area of the border. So maybe not day after tomorrow exactly, but still some pretty uh, serious side effects. Um, Diego. So carbon sequestration, right? Okay, so carbon sequestration, is that a temporary fix? Won't that carbon dioxide come back up eventually? And does it harm the animals that live down there where they're pumping it? Anybody know anything about that? I mean, I'm, I don't know much about carbon sequestration at all. It's not a technology that I'm really mm -hmm. familiar with. Maybe you guys would be more familiar with that. I, my thought is that more CO2 in the ocean is probably not great because the CO the ocean is already absorbing a lot of the extra CO2 from the atmosphere and that's causing ocean acidification. The ocean is becoming more acidic and the coral reefs are dying because of that. So I don't know if carbon sequestration would add to that. My instinct says maybe it would, but I don't know enough about the carbon sequestration to really answer that. I guess the idea is they pump it deep enough into the deeper ocean currents that don't surface often. And so that's why they're doing it. But I can't, I can't see how it's not a temporary, not a real permanent solution. That's, um, so if you dissolve a gas into a liquid, wouldn't it just rise to the top? That's what, that's what Diego was asking. And I guess maybe not because really, really cold liquids can hold dissolved gases longer. And so I guess maybe if they think they're pumping it deep enough into the colder parts that maybe it will stay down there longer. But as we're finding out in so many places, things that are supposed to stay cold and, and store carbon dioxide aren't really doing that the way they used to anymore, right? So, so, yeah. Um, other questions? In topic two? Diego? Okay. So, the oceans are getting warmer. Does that mean less oxygen for us over time? Does... Does the ocean heating up imply that there will be less oxygen for us? Maybe how it affects phytoplankton or, I don't know. We're not sure. I'm not sure. I, I do know that warmer oceans do cause the more extreme weather events. I think that's the main fear with the warmer oceans. Um, so you, so it might, be, it might have a possibility to be the opposite. Maybe if warmer weather grew more phytoplankton, there would be more oxygen. I don't know, but maybe that would create more warming also. You know, it's cyclical. Okay, one more question. Go for it. We know that water is going to heat up. It's fast, right? So 
Yes. So the rise of sea levels due to heat, melting ice, just causing expansion of water in various ways. Well, I don't know about that, but I do know that the melting of ice <laughs> definitely raises sea level. Anybody want to tackle that one and maybe explain how it is that Antarctic ice and Greenland ice can raise sea levels? Well, I think it's just you have a large body of ice in the north and the south, and when that melts, it's b turning from a solid into a liquid, right? And so more liquid is coming into the ocean, and so yet the sea level is rising and taking over land masses that, are, that aren't very... Like Florida, for instance, <laughs> more along like at sea level, not a lot of mountains there. The ocean is creeping up on those islands. The Marshall Islands are going to disappear probably uh, within the next few years. And there are people living on those islands. So that's definitely a real possibility. And the temperature also, because less ice, it's going to make, definitely it's going to warm the oceans. Not good. So I don't, do we know that ice reflects sunlight back? And so that the more ice there is, the overall cooling effect it has on the planet. So as the ice melts. So the thing about climate change is very, it's very cyclical. Am I saying that correctly? Um, as it gets hotter, it's just going to keep getting hotter, right? Unless we find a way to make it cold again. So what? Oh, that's a good question. We're almost to that. What, what are we trying to do to fix this? I think there were some questions about animal species out there. Natalie. So how are species adapting to climate change? And what was the other one? Or how is climate change affecting species? There was a... Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, there was an interesting study done in China. They were looking at how the trees and other species bloom, and now they're blooming at different uh, seasons just because of the weather getting warmer. So they've been looking at how the, the tree lines have been receding over time just because of those changes in temperature. So for example, trees, plants, some of them have been adapting by blooming either later or uh, depending on the temperature, but also other species are just started to migrate because they're actually is trying to escape the weather. For a species to adapt, let's say to like evolve in a sense that they would just not care about climate change, it would take more time that we were actually seeing. It's easier for them to just migrate. And this is also leading to other species or other pests uh, being in places that they're usually not be there. And I think you can add a little bit more of that. Yeah, I think that species are gonna be, I mean, like the plants, the blooming earlier, I mean, the plant isn't making a conscious decision to do that, that we know, but it's the, the temperature gets to a certain point and the plant at that temperature, now I bloom. That becomes a problem when, for example, a bird or a butterfly that pollinates that plant hasn't migrated to that area yet. Do you know what I mean? So maybe it misses the bloom or maybe it just throws everything out of balance in that way because historically for ever, uh, for thousands of years, the plant and the pollinators are in sync. They're there in the same place at the same time with temperature warming and throwing things off that might not necessarily happen. So you have things getting out of sync. Um, I think a lot of animals are trying to migrate to different places um, because of climate change. They're not getting the habitat and the climate that they need. And that's another reason why the border wall is such a big problem because it blocks migration. And so it would keep animals from adjusting their range for climate change. So if 
animals from the south needed to move northward because of climate change, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. And that's a huge problem. Or vice versa, animals moving north or moving south. So, Awesome. Any other questions about topic two? Yes, Ian. <laughs> Uh huh. Like the penguins? <laughs> uh, so, if Antarctica were to disappear because it's mostly ice, though not all ice, there's some land mass under there, but a lot of ice, what would happen to the animals that live there and depend on that? Uh, I think that there's a high likelihood of extinction. Maybe some animals will be able to adapt um, but like you just said adaptation is a really 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 long slow process um, animals and plants don't just adapt like that when they are confronted with a new situation especially with something that's happening so fast it takes a long time for genetic variation to result in new ways of surviving in a new environment so yeah, I think extinction is a really high possibility for a lot of those species. I mean, even things that we don't think about, I know that they were looking at puffins, which I don't, know, I don't think they're totally an Antarctic species, but they're a northern species. Um, has anyone seen pictures of puffins before? The little, cute little birds, big bills. Um, they feed normally on minnows, these tiny little minnows, little fish and they're thin fish that can fit, they can fit like six or seven of them in their bill, which is really cool. And that's what they feed their young. But now because of climate change, those minnows don't exist in the waters where the puffins are anymore. And so they don't have their typical food source. Well, they're still gonna fish, so they have started getting bigger fish, these butterfish that are like this big. They try to feed that to their babies. And there's video footage of these puffin chicks like choking on the fish because they can't actually eat it and so they starve so things like that um, it's really sad I think I saw a blue planet video or something about how far the puffins are having to fly out now to try to find their like they're talking like a three hour flight one way just to get these little minnows and a three hour flight back that's just one trip and so things like that can lead to mass extinctions and for animals that can't adapt, I know, right? Don't cry, no, but it's okay. Okay, any other questions about topic two? Okay, so moving on to our last topic. Now, so all these things are happening. What are some solutions? What are some things we might think about doing to try to slow this down, stop it, prevent it from getting worse in the future? Anybody want to ask a question from topic three? Rosa. Is there a way to fix emissions from landfill waste? So methane and some other gases that might be, be, be being emitted from landfills. Is there something we can do about that? I really don't know about that myself. Turning it into energy. Some of the landfills are doing that? Uh -huh. Well, yeah, but it's not like what we can do or what like society oh. can do. Can Either do or both? Yeah. Both. So, like Dr. Hampton was saying, uh, some industries try to capture the methane from the landfills and then repurpose it as an energy source. So that's I have read about that. that they can do. Did you guys hear that? So there are some companies that are trying to get the methane that is coming off of these landfill areas and uh, use it to make uh, natural gas that you could burn for other energy sources. So taking that methane, because I don't know if you know that natural gas is methane. Like the, if you have a natural gas um, line in your house that operates your stove or whatever, that's methane gas. So there are companies, a few companies out there that are trying to take the methane and siphon it off or gather it um, through technology and use it 
for stuff we could actually use fuel for. So we're creating the methane, maybe we can use it as a fuel. So that's one thing. It's not a very big technology at this time, but there are companies working with it. And so maybe one of you would start a company like that in the future. It's a big risk. And you know, you may not capture, maybe way too expensive to put the company in place to capture all that methane, but it needs to be done. <clears throat> so that's where you as the voter comes in and you vote <coughs> that we would have state and federal policies to help the industries like this advance. Awesome. In this sense, uh, using the landfills as a means of energy, it's an ingenious way of dealing with it. Other countries are being more efficient with it even further because they recycle most of their materials. There are countries now that are actually not producing any trash because they recycle everything they can. And those things that cannot be recycled, they're turning to compost. Here at Bowie, you're a great example because you have the Bowie garden. And I know that to have that garden, <coughs> you have to put all your energy, but also dedicate some time into producing those crops, into getting the compost ready. So you're being more efficient with the waste. So these landfills may produce a lot of energy, but if it was already separated and the materials recycled and only the compost used for that methane, it would have been a more efficient method. So you guys already are setting an example by using some of the energy and producing some compost and working in the garden because from things that wouldn't be wasted, now you're actually getting crops. So that's ways to deal with it. You're able to use your own energy, your own classes as part of projects that are leading to producing food and also using energy more efficiently. There was actually a move a few years ago to try to get our cafeteria lunch waste to be taken out to the compost in the garden but there are laws, sanitation laws and stuff like that, that city codes that stopped it. And I think that people gave up. But imagine that if all the ap un uneaten apples and oranges and carrots and all that stuff, instead of just going into the trash, it went out to the compost in the garden just to make new soil for the garden. It might still release some methane, but at least you're getting some benefit out of it and less trash in the landfill. So as citizens, I think what our panel is saying is if you learn to separate your trash, and you will have less trash in general if you compost the stuff that will degrade on its own and recycle what can be recycled. Because part of the problem with our recycling in the United States is that we're not very good at separating recycling. And so a lot of it just ends up in the trash anyway because we don't have the resources to separate the bad recycling from the actually recyclable. So these are habits that you are still young enough to develop now, right? As an adult, it's harder for change and people are less willing to change. But if you already develop these habits now, that could be something that might make a difference in the future. And demanding, imagine like how, how much of us, how many of us realize we vote with our dollars? Like, did you ever think about buying something that's made out of recycled goods instead of something that's not. And if you only bought stuff made out of recycled materials, there would be, that would influence more companies to form that use recycled materials and we would grow that possibility. So being a smart consumer of what you buy can have an impact also. That's interesting. I challenge everyone to use their water bottle about 10 times before you throw it away. Don't keep buying new water bottles. That's one little thing we can do. Yeah. yeah, we're working on making art out of recycled materials right now. So just to repurpose yeah. recycling. It's been an interesting project so far, hasn't it? All right. Um, I know there were some other questions about topic three. Victor, and then we'll do you, Dylan. How can we prevent? How can we prevent pollution? Or what are some ways that we can stop pollution from getting into the air in the first place? you but I would say I think another big source of pollution that maybe we don't think about is buildings buildings are actually a huge source of pollution because we are heating and cooling 
our buildings and we don't build structures in a way that is energy efficient. So if the heat and the cold is just escaping through the windows because it's not well insulated, then you're just blowing all of that heat and cool into the atmosphere and you're wasting a lot of energy. So living in building energy efficient buildings is one thing that we could do that would make a huge impact on climate change. Um, as well as more energy efficient vehicles or even not driving vehicles altogether, public transportation, all of those things are great things to do. And do you have anything else to say about that? There's a lot of things you can do that are like a lot smaller than that. Like plastic it takes a lot of energy to create this because it's made out of fossil fuels. So maybe avoid buying new plastic use a reusable water bottle. You can try to avoid red meat. Uh, the production of red meat uses a lot of energy to water them, to grow their food, to heat them, to feed them. So maybe if you just eat a little less red meat. You Sorry, can, Diego. Yeah. <laughs> eat less red meat. <laughs> uh, don't idle your car. That's a really high source of traffic pollution. If you can not go through a drive through maybe just get down out of your car. Don't sit in your car with the AC on. <laughs> <laughs> hard in El Paso. Yeah. yeah. But if you get down, it's not hot in there, and you wait inside the Starbucks or whatever. So. <laughs> yeah. So personal choices, like if you're aware of what they are, you can create good habits, right? So I made a commitment this year to not buy any more plastic water bottles for myself to use, and I've pretty much stuck to it. Like, mm -hmm. I have an emergency, bought some plastic waters, but I try to reuse them a lot, even if I buy them, or just bring my reusable water bottle filled with water every day. And that's something personal if we all did it, right? It's really important also to be mindful that you have influence in the people around you. For example, Mayra was mentioning idling of cars, and we see that a lot here in the school where your parents might be waiting to pick you up and then they're just hiding in their car waiting for you, somebody to get in and if you're like hey you can just wait for me like park uh, I can meet you over down a street just so you don't have to be idling creating more pollution so the choices we do make not only affects the overall environment it also affects the choices that people around are gonna make uh, in Iceland, for example, they realized that buying toothpaste packaged in a cardboard box was pointless. I mean, you never use the cardboard for your toothpaste. You always just get it out the cardboard and use the paste. So now, people stopped buying toothpaste that came in a cardboard box. That forced companies to, you know what, I need to sell only the tubes that can stand alone so people will just grab it. So those little choices eventually become trends. And when you establish trends, then the people that are producing the pollution or that are making other choices need to change as well. Things you can influence in your school, for example. The things you're doing with the garden, again, that garden is absorbing some of the pollutants. If more trees were planted along the border, well, those trees are gonna intercept the pollutants. That might be another way. In other regions, they're starting to plant trees next to freeways just to create a little bit more shade so the pavement, the pavement doesn't heat that much. So there are things that we can start doing, but I think the greatest effect starts with us. And you might feel small as an individual, but that's how trends start to happen. And if you think that that's impossible, well, social media is a great example of viral videos, memes that started with just one person, and now everybody does it. So you can, you can be that, that kind of social influencer, imagine? All right. Um, can we talk a little bit about environmental law and companies like Asarco that were kind of driven out of business by people saying, we're tired of breathing your pollution. We want laws to protect ourselves and what companies have had to do to, to comply with those environmental laws. About a soccer, must might have. Do you have anything? Well, that was really just people yeah. going to council meetings and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, if you guys ever look up Joint Advisory Committee or <coughs> JAC, that's a group that has all the civil leaders in El Paso, New Mexico, and Juarez. 
So you can go there and tell them J-A-C. what you like. The people that were complaining about the bus hub here, they would go to those meetings. But if they had all of you guys there, maybe it would have made a bigger difference. So JAC, Joint Advisory Council. Google it. Mm-hmm. And DeSarco had closed down, but uh, probably 30, 40 years ago, it was putting 1,440 tons of air pollution uh, a year into our air. <clears throat> and then in, uh, it got lower to about 250 tons per year. Um, and then it shut down for about six years, and then they decided they wanted to open up again. And that's when the community came together, uh, clubs and organizations and schools from Ciudad Juarez, from Sierra Blanca, from Las Cruces, from even from Austin and from El Paso, of course. Lots of people at the university came together and formed a huge group who went to Austin and uh, told the, the organization that was going to give a SARCO permission to reopen, the TCEQ, told them, we don't want this to happen. We don't want this to happen. And because of many reasons, <clears throat> but one in particular with so many people so uh, opposed to that, it did not reopen. Otherwise, we would be breathing that stuff again. So there are laws that regulate how much pollution can be emitted. We call those safe levels, right? Um, but do companies always follow the laws? No. And Asarco is a classic example of a company that just refused to comply with the environmental laws because it's more expensive to clean your air before you release it into the environment and it lowers profits. And so, I mean, finally people did stand up against Asarco, but how many companies out there are breaking laws about emissions but aren't getting caught? So are they complying are there better types of not just laws but technology that can clean that kind of air before it gets out there and are companies willing to invest in it and again the power of the dollar if you vote by buying stuff do your research and buy from companies that have less profit but protect the environment more something to think about Um, Other questions? Dylan, I'm sorry, I know you've had your hand up a couple times. (laughs) You forgot. Predictions for the future. Are we going to fix it? (laughs) Is it going to get worse (laughs) before it gets better? I think Nova had a, a question real similar to that. What was your question, Nova? So is, it st- is climate change and pollution stoppable, or is it just an inevitable part of our current lifestyle? And, and improving the quality of life for other poor countries around the world, does that lead to just the worsening of the situation? Sorry. <laughs> Gloomy question. Well, it's up to us. If we buy those big old trucks that make a lot of pollution and we drive them all the time and we idle all the time and we have our thermometers set so it's freezing cold in our house, in the summertime and burning hot, or then, then it's not going to get better. But if the border people, people who live on the border, who breathe the, gl- the glass going down their throats, um, do something about it, come up with the better technologies, fight against the industries that do it wrong, try to get better uh, people who are, are in charge of our state and federal government, that will, that will make sure that those laws are enforced so that if an industry that wants to pollute as much as they want, uh, they get fined, they pay the fine, and they keep on polluting. Well, we can say, hey, we're not going to have that happen. We can make a picket fence around them. We can say, don't buy their product. So it depends on what we do, because without us taking the positive actions, and we is a lot, a lot of people, but the border people have real strong voices. and. If you went to Bowie High School, you have a particularly strong voice because you lived right here where it was happening. Anybody else? Um, I think it is stoppable, and I don't think you should be disheartened by it because for the past 50 years, EPA has been lowering pollution levels, and somehow the industry started to adjust to them. So we shouldn't let, for example, the EPA is trying to like raise it up a little, saying it's not that bad. 
but if you make your voice heard, if you vote for uh, people that support climate change um, uh, preventative measures, then it can be stopped. And like we've mentioned, other things that you can do personally in your life, for your parents, your friends, then I think it is stoppable. So stoppable, but we all have to do our part, right? Not just our personal part, but who do you vote for? Like, do you vote for people who enforce environmental law, that protect environmental law, and lower pollution, or? Well, I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We're not going to get that political today, but you know what I'm talking about. All right. Anybody else want to have anything to say about that? Um, the only other thing I'll say is that I think that there is hope, but I also think that you should understand how urgent this is because the effects of climate change that we're seeing today are the effects of climate change that was of the pollution that was produced years ago. We haven't even seen the effects of cl the climate change that we are creating right now. All the pollution we're creating right now, we're going to see that in a few years. So we need to stop what we're doing and make radical changes as soon as possible. So it's not something like, well, maybe later we'll work on it. In just another 20 years, we'll develop a little bit more and then, and then we'll get better and we'll do more regulations on industry and all of that. We can't, we can't afford to do that. We have to make changes as soon as possible. And uh, like Dr. Hampton was saying, you guys do have a lot of power. Maybe you don't think that you have a lot of power, but we have power in numbers. And something that I've learned as an organizer, one of the principles of organizing is you have the power of money and you have the power of people. And we're never going to have the power of money that these industries have. But we can have the power of people. And if we can get enough people who care enough about this issue and want to make a change for themselves and for the people that they care about, then we really can make a huge difference. And there are people who are trying to do that right now. And you guys can be a part of that or start your own thing. But it is definitely an urgent issue. Agree. Anybody have any more questions? We probably have time for one more. You're, you're not wrong about that, right? So Stephen's basically asking, like, even if we start changing now, it's not, it's not going to change that fast, right? Because the gases that are already in the environment, they're going to stay here for a while, right? But I think that was Amanda's point. Like, that's why we have to start changing now. Like, because we're going to feel the impacts of what we're doing right now later. But the longer we wait to change, the longer it's going to last. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Like, like those yeah, the pollution masks, we're all going to have to start wearing them? Hopefully not. <laughs> I hope not. So, so yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. Um, as the population increases, we're probably going to consume more energy. And that's why we have to start fixing the problem now. Because if we don't, it's not going to get better. It's just going to get worse if we don't start now trying to lower it. What time is it? Do we have time for more? Anybody have any well, closing? Uh, to add a little bit to that, and it kind of summarizes what we have been saying as a panel. I mean, we've seen that the trends of climate change have been going up. As Maida mentioned, we've done a better job. EPA has been regulated more. So now the trends are not going that high. But still, that's not a solution. Even if we're becoming more efficient, the trend is still going up. Population is going to increase as well. So that's also going to keep up the trend. Unless we start doing more things about it. We start doing changes on our own. We start working together. Because now, if more people are mindful of our climate change, we're producing better efficient energies, we're being more mindful of the decisions, then we're able to revert the change. 
then we can start correcting on all that pollution, all that change in the environment that happened five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We need to reach that tipping point where we're gonna start changing the trend. And then things like increased population and more people working together are actually gonna be a benefit for us because if now more people are working towards a better environment, then that might reverse all those trends. But we need to reach that point, and that's the most important thing. And education, being mindful, working together, I think they're the take-home messages of this panel. For sure. I think there's a lot of people that still really don't believe in climate change or that it's a problem. So we really do need to get educated and know what our issues are. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. So we'd like to thank our panel. Thank you for that great round of applause. Thank our panel for coming to talk to us today and sharing their ideas. Um, thank you guys for your questions. I hope you're inspired to become social influencers of a different type, to become more educated and help all of us create better habits that will improve our environment for the future. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. That was really Thank fun. So Thank you so much. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Really insightful question. You have a smart uh, So this is one of my classes, but I brought in representatives of all the other classes. But we had a lot of absences today. I'm not sure what's going on, but, but uh, thank you very much. Really nice to meet you. Thank you so much for inviting me. So you know I'm going to call on you again for other things. So we do project-based learning here. So.